to round out this session, we're going to go in a slightly different direction. Barbara Cohen is going to talk about development of in situ geochronology techniques in a different kind of in situ than we've been talking about. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I know this crowd is uh, means in situ in a, in a different way. <clears throat> So I'm, I'm super happy to be able to talk to you. These talks have been super interesting for me too. Um, but yeah, when I say institute here, I'm talking about bringing our instruments to Mars itself instead of bringing the sample back to the lab. Um, and if you're interested in this topic, um, I'll refer you down to a paper that we um, summarized a lot of this in, in astrobiology. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm sure I don't need to convince this crowd, but um, something that I want to bring some attention to as we're developing these um, institute dating techniques, these ways to bring the labs um, to Mars and to other planets is what we're really after is creating a framework for the solar system. And Chris showed this as one of his first slides, right, which is how do we take the ages that we're getting from units on Mars, from lithologies on the moon, from places on asteroids that we get from meteorites, um, how do we, we use those to tell the history of the planet and we say, okay, this is when lava flows were active, this is when magnetic fields were active. Um, but what we're really trying to get to is why do planets behave that way? What's happening in the solar system? Um, so when something is happening on the Earth, when we're experiencing, for example, late heavy bombardment, was Mars experiencing that too at the same time? And what implications does that have for the, the structure of the crust and our prospects for life there? Um, what were the asteroids doing at that time? How long are planetary heat engines active and, and what characteristics of the planets do they depend on? So there's a lot of questions tied up with geochronology that um, we're trying to uh, answer from a lot of different places. Um, but sample return from all of those places is just not going to happen in my professional lifetime, maybe over like human scale, uh, you know, society scale kind of thing maybe, but I'm talking about like things that I want to do in my professional lifetime, right? So um, we're not going to get samples from everywhere that we want to. It's a long way to get to even um, our first Mars sample return campaign. So what we're talking about is making instruments, uh, creating techniques and bringing them to the planets with us. And this is really no different from what we do with uh, rovers or in situ instruments now. So um, we bring a whole host of things to other planets to measure their major element chemistry, their mineralogy, um, things like that. We already do this. Um, so this is uh, sort of the next step. I get a lot of blowback from um, from old school isotopers that have a lot to say about our prospects for institute dating, that it's really hard, that you miss a lot of context. Um, those are all true statements, um, but we don't hold up our exploration because it's not as perfect as we get on the earth. Um, as we continue to push um, the limits of our terrestrial laboratories and the last talk was a really good example of that, right? How do we push our uh, analyte limitations way, way down on the earth? Um, in situ analyses, um, you have to step back the questions that you're asking. They're never going to be as precise as what we can do on the Earth. We hope that they're just as accurate, um, but they're never going to be as precise. Um, and But we don't let that stop us in other realms. We don't say that because we can do ICPMS trace element analysis on the Earth that we should never send an APXS to Mars. That is not something that reasonable people uh, say. So we should not be applying that standard to geochronology. Instead, what we should be doing is saying, what questions can we answer with the precision that we can get with in situ geochronology and the context and our understanding and how can we move that forward? So things that have flown in this arena, um, Beagle 2 carried uh, a payload that was capable of doing in situ geochronology. That was one of its stated goals. Unfortunately, the Beagle uh, 2 did not uh, contact Earth, so that um, spacecraft didn't, didn't work. Um, I'm going to spend a pretty significant chunk of time here talking about the Curiosity experiment, um, just because this is a fun audience so that you can appreciate all of the talks that we've seen about um, 
the precision that you have to, or the, the techniques that you're developing for the earth, how we have to, um, how we implement those kinds of techniques using robotic uh, avatars on the surface. And then I'll talk about um, things that are in um, development. Okay, so I'm gonna, uh, like I said, spend a good chunk of time talking about the Curiosity Experiment, which is the first um, set of in situ dating experiments that we've done on another planet. Um, the Curiosity payload was not um, optimized or not created to do in situ dating, um, and so you'll see some of that in the techniques that come out. Uh, and then, but we can use that to really draw some lessons learned on some of the topics we just touched on. So Curiosity um, went to this place uh, called Gale Crater. It went there because there is a substantial mountain in the center of the crater um, composed, we think, of sediments, um, definitely uh, layers that you can see even from orbit. Um, this is a picture showing uh, Mount Sharp, the mountain in the middle there, um, from the Curiosity landing site. So you can see um, from the bottom up, there's some sand dunes. Um, they're very recent uh, Aeolian sand dunes. Um, on top of these lacustrian sediments that um, are called the Murray Formation. So these are uh, sediments that have been um, deposited into the crater um, after the crater formed um, from the surrounding highlands. Um, we sort of wrapped up a campaign on Vera Rubin Ridge um, a year or two ago, and since then we've been going up into this Glen Torridon unit. Um, the, those are uh, units that are distinguished from orbit, you can see they're different colors here. Um, Vera Rubin Ridge is a high standing ridge. Um, it's uh, got a hematite signature from orbit. When we got there, it turns out that there, there's hematite in it for sure, but there's not that much difference um, between that and the Murray Formation sediments. There are some differences, um, but it's probably all part of the same kind of um, sedimentary unit. Um, Glen Turidan, uh, again, is, is more mudstones and stuff. It's related to the same sedimentary package. Um, it's got some clay minerals in it. Um, all of these actually have clay minerals in them. It's just uh, slight differences that make um, our orbital images light up. Um, and then we'll be climbing up to that sulfate unit. So something that we really want to understand is how are these deposited? When were they deposited? What kind of environment were they deposited in? And all that hangs together to be able to say, what was the environment of Mars like when? And how long were those environments active? Right. So you can't just drop a bug down and uh, have water for six months and hopefully you're going to produce a biosignature. It's got to be active for a long time. You've got to allow time um, for things like that to thrive. So the sedimentary system has already been estimated based on crater counts and other relative methods um, to be active around three, three and a half billion years ago um, in a warm and clement environment that gives you access to lake deposits and not a lot of acid weathering. Um, the basaltic plains around the crater um, have crater density ages, and I think Fred's probably going to talk about these later, um, that put those crater density ages at about 3.6 to 3.8 billion years. So those basaltic plains around it formed then, and then the uh, crater was carved out, and then the sedimentary system was filling in the crater. Okay, so let me walk you through how we did the in-situ dating experiments. Um, first, you have to understand the lithology. You know, you, none of us would ever, you know, go out and pick up a piece of rock and just chuck it in a mass spectrometer and be like, well, I wonder what the age is, right? That's not a thing. You have to understand the rock. You have to understand the mineralogy. You have to pose the question, what is it that you're trying to, to date, right? What is the geologic event that you're interested in that that isotopic ratio will yield for you? So you have to have some geologic context for Curiosity. We have a whole suite of remote sensing from orbit um, and mass cam. Um, here you can see uh, the dust removal tool and uh, a lid spot there um, as, uh, as it gets cleared off of the dust. Um, and you can see the textures of the rock. Um, so then we would measure that rock. Um, we would measure the tailings of the rock. So we drill into the rock. Here's a drill core. That's like a, a pencil size across. Um, the drilling, you can see yeah, that's a much different color. There's that famous rusty surface of Mars, but um, protected under the surface, it's a, a lot grayer. Um, then we would use the APXS, the Alpha Particle X-ray Spectrometer. Um, that's a, a standoff um, instrument on the end of the robotic arm. We put that down onto the tailings pile, which is a nice homogen homogenized uh, version of the rock, and you can get the major elements that way. 
So you get your potassium. In this case, we're doing potassium argon dating. You get your bulk potassium on the rock that way. Okay, but now you've got to measure the argon in that sample. And of course, potassium and argon uh, are in two different states. Potassium is relatively easy to measure. It's a rock forming mineral. You can measure it with uh, something like an X-ray spectrometer. With argon, you've got to actually ingest it and put it into a mass spectrometer and sniff that argon. Um, and you've got to make sure that you're getting uh, all the argon out. Um, so what we do with that sample when we drill it, um, I'm going to play this animation for you. Um, and I just want you to appreciate the beauty and complexity that is the Chimera system. Because as we drill the hole, the powder gets conveyed up this tube and gets stored into the chamber inside the drill bit assembly. Then to move the powder out of the drill bit, we use the robotic arms, wrist and turret joint and the vibration caused by the drill's percussion mechanism to move the sample like so. We continue this motion to deliver it to the Chimera, which is the sample processing and delivery device. So the drill sample comes up through the sample transfer tube into the chambers into Chimera. As we open her up, we could see where the sample comes in from the drill then we would send the sample up through the scoop to take a picture of it. Once we do that, we then move the sample through the sieve and into the portion box to create a portion for the instruments inside the belly of curiosity. And those portions are the size of a baby aspen tablet. So yeah, those are all the things that you know we do by second nature as laboratory scientists. We take that powder and we go, uh, okay, done, right? It's a lot more intense to be doing that with a rover on the surface of Mars. Um, so we have to um, do a lot of, uh, Curiosity did a lot of testing with that uh, system to understand how much material is being moved to each instrument. It's a really crucial measurement in the calculation of the ages is that portioning. Um, I don't think that gets enough um, uh, enough attention as a potential source of uncertainty. And they did the best they can. It's certainly not a criticism, um, but that's a pretty big source of the uncertainty. Um, we know, as, as we drew oops, sorry, we know that the, uh, you know, in the bulk rock, um, potassium can be cited in multiple different minerals. In fact, you know, it's a detrital system. Of course it is. Um, so uh, we do another step with the, uh, with that powder, um, which is look at it in Kemen, which is an XRD instrument. Um, so it gets portioned through the sieve that you can see here, dropped into Kemen. Kemen does uh, X-ray diffraction on it. And from that pattern, you can see what uh, minerals are there. And then you can make a pretty educated guess about where your potassium is sited in the bulk rock. Um, sometimes, you know, if you have a nice uniform sample and you've just got some potassium feldspars in there, olivine and pyroxene, then you pretty much know where your potassium is sited. But most of these rocks also have a significant portion of phyllosilicates in them. One of them's got gerasite, as we'll see. And so your potassium could be in multiple different phases. And we have to sort of proportion out um, into those different phases based on the XRD. Um, and then finally, the powder moves into the SAM instrument. And here's a picture of the SAM instrument. This is not something that you're going to put on a backpack and carry with you into the fields. Uh, it's a very, very complex, very beautiful instrument. Um, and what I'm showing down here is the uh, valve diagram for that instrument. Um, so the, the sample comes in here in the, in the SMS. Um, and the, the sample comes down. There's a curacel in here that's got little cups in it. That powder falls into the cups. Um, the cup can rotate around. Um, and then get slotted up and to make a micro seal into, and then an, uh, an induction oven, right? So the oven is what heats up the sample and then that gas is evolved and it comes out into uh, this big circuit diagram here. Um, so then it's, you know, your normal sort of argon mass spectrometry techniques. There's a uh, gettering in here to uh, clean up that gas. Um, there's uh, an ingenious way that they did sort of after the fact so you have a semi-static state that concentrates the noble gases um, and so that you can look at uh, not just um, the argon, the radiometric argon, but also um, all the other noble gases and you can do um, cosmic ray exposure dating as well. So I just want you to sort of appreciate all the steps that Curiosity had to do to get these ages, um, but it really shows you the feasibility of um, 
of doing different kinds of, uh, asking different kinds of questions on Mars that you might be able to answer with in situ dating. So the basic results are um, on three different um, lithologies. Um, before, uh, I'll just say quickly, we lost the ability to do that portioning, that chimera um, powder portioning. Um, we've lost that ability on Curiosity, so we can't do these experiments anymore, unfortunately. Um, we lost that ability right as I became a participating scientist. What a coincidence. Um, so the three different lithologies here, Cumberland, Winjana, and Mojave, um, the different aliquots that we used, Cumberland was a whole rock. Um, Winjana was also a whole rock, but in two different aliquots um, at two different temperatures. Um, and uh, Mojave, um, we did try to, um, it's a whole rock, but we tried to do a two-step heating um, where we heated up uh, to a lower temperature to degas the plagioclase and then heat it up to a higher temperature to degas the jericite. So um, that's what we were hoping to get out of that. And um, from the results, you can see that the normal detrital minerals, the normal detrital plagioclase that we would interpret from coming from those basaltic highlands has an age of about 4 billion years, a little older than 4 billion years. That's completely consistent with that crater density age from the highlands around that would have been supplying that material. Um, when Jana was incompletely degassed, we're not really sure why. It may have to do um, with having um, too big of crystals or um, something like that. We're not entirely sure, but um, we're pretty sure we didn't degas the sample, and that's why you're seeing these artificially um, low ages. Um, but the thing that's super interesting is this last one down here, the jericite age. The jericite was probably formed in situ after the sedimentation event um, as a uh, uh, alteration mineral in place, and that is reflective of water flowing through that system after those minerals um, were deposited. So that reflects a fluid flow uh, episode. Um, so talking about these results, um, the, the precision that you need really depends on the question being asked. And this is what I was uh, saying in the beginning, that that jericite age, even though it's not um, very precisely constrained, kind of doesn't matter that it's not precisely constrained. It's two billion years old. That is a lot different from three and a half billion years old. That's, that's different enough within the error bars to say that yes, that is a later fluid flow stage um, that's important for Mars hydrothermal activity. It correlates with just Amazonian aged uh, activity that's going on in the area. So for that, you didn't need a very precise constraint to be able to say, yeah, here's some Amazonian fluid flow that's reflected in this basin. The detrital ages are a little bit different, right? The detrital ages are, you're trying to use them to understand when the bedrock around the crater formed. Um, and so you want those to be more precise than the crater density ages that you can count from orbit. But they are not. They uh, they don't have they have a precision that allows all those crater density ages, and it doesn't further um, constrain the crater density ages. So it didn't really add a lot to the conversation. It just said, well, yep, the uh, in situ age is around the same as the crater density age. Um, but there's a whole bunch of things, and I'm sure Fred's going to talk about a lot of these. Um, we don't really understand how to correlate the crater densities on Mars with the crater densities on the moon. Um, that's a big part of what future Mars sample return um, objectives are, future uh, in situ dating objectives are. Um, so right now, the curiosity results did not uh, constrain that um, with any meaningful precision. And the method that you need to use also depends on the materials. Um, as I said, the potassium is hosted in a bunch of different places in these kinds of mudstones and sandstones. Maybe mudstones and sandstones aren't the things that you want to try to date in situ. Maybe you need to find some nice lava flow on Mars to do a really good job. Um, so you can think about either helping pick a place that's got better uh, better behaved rocks for your system, or you can think about ways to tweak your system to deal with the rocks. And so you can also look at spot by spot isochrons. So if we pick up a sample and we can target individual spots or minerals, much like we do in the laboratory, um, that's something that also would help us make these interpretations. 
Um, in-situ dating is uh, something that we want to do, obviously, for these geochronology reasons, but um, one of the interesting things that came out of the curiosity measurements is um, guiding future observations. So um, some of the interpretations of um, the cosmic ray exposure dating that Curiosity did was to quantify the denudation rate of the sediments that were on and they sort of are coming in layers. And so if you are interested in having uh, access to organic material that has been protected from UV rays, you might want to find places where that scarps, the scarps are retreating and you might want to confirm how long they've been exposed by doing cosmic ray exposure dating. Um, and I just, again, the resources that you need sort of guides how often you can use it. You can make a really wonderful instrument, um, but if it requires things like drilling, powdering, portioning, delivering, and then using big instruments, you're not going to be able to use it very often on the mission. So simplifying the technique is another thing that we want to be able to do. So in that spirit, um, some of the in-situ dating instruments that are being developed, I'm doing one, but there's a whole host of them out there. Um, but they all have to um, they all have to meet some basic guidelines. They have to have accuracy, obviously. They have to be precise for the question that you're asking. They have to be interpretable and they have to be meaningful, right? So we have to be able to uh, not just say, yeah, the highlands of Mars are around four billion years. We already know that. So we have to be able to make something that's more meaningful than that. So you have to recognize it as a geologic event. The geologic event has to be interpretable. Um, there's a lot of standardization, obviously, that, that needs to happen. So potassium, argon, rubidium, strontium, and uranium, thorium, lead are all in development as isotopic systems. Um, you can get cosmogenic nuclides sort of for free out of your potassium argon, or you could do them um, purpose-driven. Um, luminescence or other dissymmetry-based techniques are also being developed, and I'll touch on them real quickly. Um, there's more that you can do um, with sort of relative dating um, or sort of an in-between thing, right? Like how, how long has something been accumulating, right? So if you were uh, accumulating micrometeorites on the surface, you could uh, try to figure out what that accumulation rate is and then figure out the, the surface age that way. Um, but I will say that of the, you know, the radiometric techniques and the dissymmetry techniques, these are not a standoff or remote techniques. It's not something where you point and shoot and get an age out of it. These are all things that need to have a sample that's acquired and handled to various degrees. Now we're trying to simplify that sample acquisition and handling, um, but right now um, there's no um, really just hands-off methods. Um, and you might want to fly one or more of these together. Um, rubidium and strontium and potassium argon don't always agree. Um, that's okay, right? That gives you different information. Um, maybe uh, one didn't behave for you and one did. Maybe you have more of one element than the other. Or maybe they're just talking about different parts of the crystallization or cooling history of the rock. So all of that gives you um, really great information. Um, so potassium argon, which is the thing that I'm most familiar with, um, potassium is super common, rock-forming element, that's a really nice thing to it. Argon's a noble gas, it just uh, forms in situ, um, so they're easily separated from one another, but they can't be measured using the same technique in general, um, especially if you need to um, look at the isotopes. For potassium, you don't need to look at the isotopes. You can get the potassium-40 isotope just from a solar system constant, but for argon, you do need to look at the isotopes and understand um, where they all came from. So the way that we do this is by using a LIBS-MS technique, so laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy. This is the ChemCam instrument, on Curiosity or the SuperCam instrument on Perseverance um, fires a really high energy laser. If you had a femtosecond laser, you'd certainly want to use it, but you don't have to use it. Um, you put a lot of energy onto that rock. Um, it ablates the sample, but it also excites all the elements that it ablated off. Um, they go into an excited state. Their electrons, as they come down, release energy. They release photons of characteristic 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 wavelengths that the, you can look at with a spectrometer and you can get the major element composition. Um, so we do that pretty routinely. Um, it's a really elegant way of blasting the sample apart and letting all the argon come out. So I really like it for this um, for this um, this kind of technique. Um, the drawback is that the Libs um, process is uh, pretty uh, imprecise compared to some other things that you could choose. So I chose this because um, 
I am not a technology developer, I'm a scientist and I want the answers now. And so using a chem cam and then using a mass spectrometer um, and using some way um, of looking at the pit that they left, I don't have to develop those techniques, I don't have to do technology. Um, and in fact, we could have done this on Curiosity if we had pointed the instruments differently. Um, so the, the real um, beauty of this is that uh, it's something that we think we can do in the near term. And because this is a spot by spot analysis, you can uh, look at minerals ahead of time. You could map that sample um, and look at the minerals ahead of time and then choose where you wanna go or you could just put a grid down. This is on a solid sample. You don't have to drill the sample. You don't have to powder it. In fact, you don't want to powder it. You'd rather have a solid sample, which you could get from a drill or you could get by just picking up pebbles um, or you know, eventually maybe doing it on a rock in situ. Um, so this is what this looks like in, in our laboratory. Um, so uh, up on the right hand side, you can see a rock that we've cut and polished and all of those are little libs pits. Um, sometimes we try to target minerals, sometimes we just try to put a line down there and see what we get. Um, those would be more akin to um, mixed mineral phases and you'd get a whole rock isochron. So you'd be relying on getting different mixtures under each spot that would pull your potassium content apart and give you um, access to an isochron. Um, that's what we did for um, this graph that I'm showing you. Um, Vitus is a, uh, an ordinary chondrite, um, and so we just put some spots down and got a bulk rock composition of this ordinary chondrite, um, and you can see um, the, the uh, reference age is four and a half billion years as an ordinary chondrite. They're all about the same. Um, and we got something that uh, agrees with that, although it has a much uh, larger uncertainty. Um, but if you were to measure this um, on Mars, you'd be like, well, you know what? This isn't a sugar diet. So it depends on the question that you're asking. Um, when you look at all the things that are out there, I'm not the only one um, that's been looking at this technique. Um, and so this is a compilation of all of the published samples. Um, on the uh, x-axis is the, re the reference age, the laboratory age. On the y-axis is the age that we get with the LibsMS technique. And you can see they're on a nice one-to-one -one line. This, I think the reference age is wrong. Uh, it's an ordinary chondrite. I don't see how it can be so young. So we're looking into that. But otherwise, you know, it's a pretty reasonable technique. Um, you can see that on the y-axis, we have, you know, a lot bigger uncertainties than we do on the x-axis. So that's to be expected. Um, and then the left-hand side is just a pretty picture that we just made recently. So that's our CAD drawing of our uh, instrument um, brass board. It's not quite a fl flight prototype, but it's getting there. Um, and it's uh, about um, something like 12 inches on a side. Sorry, it's in American units. It's something like a, a foot on each side. Um, so it's still uh, pretty big, but it's all self-contained. Um, and like I said, you can just drop some pebbles in and be on your way. Um, I'd be remiss without uh, mentioning other, um, other developments, although these aren't um, currently being developed. Um, there's one with an isotope spike that you would use for powder samples similar to Curiosity, um, and Goddard picked that up from um, Ken Farley and collaborated with him for a while on that, although that's not currently active. Um, and Leah Morgan investigated how to do argon-argon dating um, in situ, um, which would be super awesome. That is something that I would love to do, but you need a pretty big lump of Californium um, and you need to launch that, which is gonna be a, a challenge. Okay, um, rubidium strontium. Um, of course, you all know about rubidium strontium. We've been hearing about that all day. So, um, but you know that you have to, uh, if you put both rubidium and strontium in, you have to have a really uh, sensitive mass spectrometer to, to do that. So the preferred method for rubidium and strontium is to separate those out from each other before you measure them. Um, there was a, a, um, an investigation uh, about 10 years ago that was just looking at um, variations in the 87 strontium, but that's only if you um, have a really high rubidium strontium ratio and you can make that assumption, which isn't going to be a great assumption to make if you run a fly a multi-million dollar instrument on a, a several hundred million dollar lander. Um, so that's not a great assumption that we want to make. Um, Scott Anderson has been doing some very, very elegant work 
um, with selective uh, ionization. So he's got a set of lasers. Um, he does the Libs ablation, same as us, gets everything up into the excited state, and then um, uses selective laser ionization to pick off um, either the rubidium electrons or the strontium electrons, depending on the wavelength that you put in there. Um, and so he will alternate those and feed those into a time of flight mass spectrometer. And so as they're going along, it'll alternate between the rubidium and the strontium that you collect on the other end. And it's a very elegant separation technique. Um, and again, you can see he gets many, many isochrons because he does this very, very I'm sorry, many, many points in his isochron because he does this very, very quickly. Um, and so you can beat down your uncertainty that way as well. And there's that Duluth Gabro standard that we heard about earlier today, too. Uh, I'm not going to talk a lot about luminescence techniques. Um, just suffice to say that they uh, people are thinking about these. Um, they're not in my real realm of interest because you uh, they're for things like sedimentary processes and denudation and dune formation and things like that um, because they're limited to um, very young events. Um, but they are out there. Um, it's this is a lot more challenging technique in its infancy, um, but these are things to look out for if these are uh, if these are events that you're interested in or, or uh, geologic processes. Hey Barbara, in the interest of time, we should wrap up so we can get to the next yep. summary. Look at perfect. <laughs> Ask and you shall receive, Chris. So uh, the curiosity measurements serve to validate these in situ de techniques. Um, there's a there's still a lot out there to do, um, but we're continuing to invest in those techniques. Um, our decadal survey for NASA is is going on right now, and we several of us have advocated that these be be included in the next decadal survey. So keep your fingers crossed, and hopefully we'll fly one of these one day. Thanks. Thanks, Barbara. I really appreciate that. It's a really nice overview of kind of what's the limitations are, but what also is being developed.